Okay, so we'll start the, this review with uh, diabetic problems. Uh, there's there's two or three, depends four, really depends upon the way that you look at it. This is a, a really quick overview of this because there's so much information, but we want to simplify it in a sense that uh, just just for the review, like when you're, you know, you're sort of <clears throat> in the testing process or you just want a quick review, some of it you would have to go back to the to the full lecture and get, but we're going to try to sum it up in, uh, in about 30 minutes or so. So the problem with diabetic patients uh, is primarily not glucose, but the absorption of glucose. So you have uh, on the, as you look at it on the, on the left, you have a normal cell right here, and it sort of just depicts how the cell uh, absorbs the glucose. Glucose ab ab absorption is an active transport, okay? That means that glucose can't enter the cell without help. Uh, so it gets the help from insulin. On each cell, there's an insulin receptor. So when the uh, pancreas releases insulin, and remember, insulin comes from a, a part of the pancreas called the islets of Lang Langerhand. Islets of Langerhand. Uh, and then the other purpose of the pancreas is digestive enzymes. So there's two purposes. Here we talk about insulin, the production of insulin. So what takes place in a normal uh, non-diabetic person is we eat that big old half pint of bluebell, right? And we have all this free floating glucose in our system, in our pancreas from the islets of Langer hands releases insulin. And what insulin does, as the picture shows, it's a good picture, the insulin will bind with the insulin receptor all right, and open up a, a channel for the glucose to enter. If this doesn't happen, glucose can't get into the cell. Remember, active transport, it needs help. So this insulin binds with the insulin, insulin receptor and opens up that channel and then the glucose enters into it. Uh, I was reading an article in a biochem book the other day and it's fascinating and I can't remember uh, what they're called but there's actually like little boats that come over and pick the glucose up and take it to the mitochondria so it enters the matrix right? And so the, uh, then it enters into the Krebs cycle and the citric, citric acid cycle and produces ATP, which produces the energy that we need. Keep in mind, remember and review that all cells for proper function requires oxygen and glucose, right? So the insulin binds, opens up the channel, Glucose enters the cell, those little boats go up there and pick up the glucose, takes it over to the matrix, it enters into the citric acid cycle and the Krebs cycle, uh, which the Krebs cycle, then the citric acid cycle, but it enters into that where it's metabolized and produces ATP, which we get energy from. So with diabetes, we have a couple problems. In type one diabetes, the pancreas is producing little to no insulin. So here, there's no, there's a lack of insulin to open up those receptors on the cell. So this patient here has to take insulin. They have to take, if, especially if they produce no insulin, they have to take insulin. All right, so in a di type one diabetic, a type two diabetic, the receptor is broken somehow. So in a type two diabetic, they may still have to take insulin to increase the sensitivity of those receptors or take other medication. Okay. A lot of type two diabe uh, diabetics, uh, they control the diabetes with, with diet and exercise. Okay. But those are, the top, those are the two types. 
So this picture here to the right, when we look at it without insulin, insulin can't get into the cell to be metabolized. So now you have, I'm sorry, not insulin. With, without insulin binding to that receptor, glucose can't get into the cell. So now you have this free floating glucose in the bloodstream. And that's where we get hyperglycemia, right? What takes place, because we have several different backup plans with, with the body, is that the, the cell will start burning fatty acids for energy. This is not the design way. This is sort of a backup plan uh, to keep the body from dying. Right? So it's, it's, the cell will start burning these fatty acids uh, to produce the energy that's needed. However, it's not uh, it won't last very long. Okay, can't do that for long periods of time. This is also when we talk about this fruity odor smell that the hyperglycemic patients have, DKA patients may have. Uh, this is where that comes from. That fruity odor smell comes from the metabolism of this fat that's that's burned off. Now that's sort of the. That diabetes depends on your level of care, but diabetes is a uh, diabetic emergencies are pretty easy to take care of. So, overall picture, insulin tra uh, insulin transports sugar into the cell, glucose into the cell, and uh, diabetes is a disease that prevents that from producing insulin or using the insulin, like in uh, type two di diabetics. So we only have, the primary thing, we only have really two types of uh, diabetic patients. We have hyperglycemic, hyper meaning above. Any, remember, anywhere where you see this GLY, that's telling you that the glucose, whether it's on a medication or in here, it's, it's talking about blood sugar. Okay? So we have hyperglycemic patients where their blood sugar's too high. Now, there's a number of reasons why they, uh, you know, this diabetic patient, maybe they didn't take enough insulin to counteract that half gallon of ice bluebell they just ate, right? Or they, they took too much or they, took, they ate too much, okay? So there's, there's reasons why the diabetic patient's hyperglycemic, okay? But the key factor in, in the review here to remember when you're either taking care of patients or uh, on a test question, it's the gradual onset. This takes several days to develop. So you, in, in that, in a test question, you're going to see the patient where they, over a period of time, the patient got these signs and symptoms that they list off. The other one, which is easier to fix, hypoglycemia, hypo meaning low, right? So low blood sugar. The key thing here is a sudden onset. So you have that football player out there doing two days and then all of a sudden these things started taking place, right? And so it could be too much insulin, too little to eat. Maybe they didn't eat. Maybe they were sick and they were vomiting, diarrhea, right? Or, or they just overexerted themselves. Either however this took place, they're losing blood sugar or they're losing blood glucose uh, so they need to replace it so they're hypoglycemic. So when we, there's another uh, that would we'll mention at the sort of the end of the of the review, uh, DKA, okay, uh, is the next one in, uh, that we'll talk about just briefly. But DKA is where the, the patient diabetic ketoacidosis is where the patient has a really high blood sugar, usually above 500 or so if you want to range. Uh, ketones, the K part of it, is they're breathing off or they're blowing off these ketones, these fatty acids. And that's what you can smell uh, with that fruity odor smell. And then the A for acid, they're acidotic. So diabetic ketoacidosis. 
so their blood pH is, uh, they're, they're acidic. And, and we'll mention that towards the end. So hypoglycemia, signs and symptoms that we look at, their breathing may be abnormal. Usually they're breathing a little faster because this is the way, remember the body controls the increase in CO2. We would have to go all the way back to the uh, citric acid cycle and review that to, to understand and see why the, they have this buildup in CO2. Uh, if you need that, then just watch the full meal deal, watch the full lecture, okay? Because it's, it's lengthy. But the body is retaining the CO2 and we notice that, the body notices that, so it starts to hyperventilate. The term is used to blow off the CO2. So they're trying to decrease the, the body's CO2, the, that increase in CO2, by breathing faster. The warm, dry skin, the rapid pulse, and then we go back here through that sweet, sort of odory, acetone smell uh, they get from uh, having those fatty acids. And then it can also lead up to unresponsiveness. You can have a patient whose blood sugar is so hot that they become unresponsive. So those are the primary signs and symptoms. And remember, <clears throat> these signs and symptoms are, symptoms are over a period of days. Okay? Everybody good? Questions? Okay. Hi, Boglas. Whoops. I deleted the, fem the hypoglycemic side. Okay, so you have signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Okay, so I'll just tell you that the altered mental status, which you can have in hyperglycemia, so you have altered mental status, cold, clammy skin, rapid pulse, but uh, the altered mental status, and would do this when we do the treatment, but you'd always do, always do a D-stick on any altered mental status or any diabetic patient. Okay. But, so you have hypoglycemic patient, you have cold clammy skin, altered mental status, low D-stick, uh, which is the normal D-stick is 80 to 120. Okay. So their D-stick is usually their D-stick is low, they're hypoglycemic, okay? and it does lead to unresponsiveness, and it's a sudden onset. The, the hypoglycemic patient, if they don't eat some calories, okay, they're going to be unresponsive, and this is usually the way that you see uh, the hypoglycemic patient, is they, are, they have a severe altered mental status, or they're unresponsive. Either because they didn't eat, they forgot to, they took too much insulin, like we talked about before. They've been sick, and they haven't been able to ingest enough calories, so they get hypoglycemic. So those are some signs and symptoms of that. So let's talk about the care. So we look at this hypoglycemic patient, and like I just said, we always check a D-stick, dextro stick. We wanna make sure that we get a blood glucose level. And hypoglycemic, and it all depends on your scope of practice, but it's fairly easy to, to fix this problem, is we want to increase their blood glucose level. Okay, so we can either do that through like oral glucose. If the patient's alert and oriented, but they're, they're, they have a low blood sugar, we can, we can do that even at home through like orange juice or, you know, something that's not going to take a long time to metabolize, but we can we can treat that on the on the mild side by giving the patient orange juice or non diet soda or uh, you know some uh, syrup something that they can take oral uh, by mouth and increase their blood sugar. Now to do that to give patient like orange juice or oral glucose or <clears throat> something of that nature, the patient has to be responsive. So they have to be able to swallow. So they can't have a decreased mental status where, the, where they can't swallow. Okay. So that's a judgment call. Can this patient swallow? 
that I can give them orange juice or some type of syrup or that to increase their blood sugar. If they have a decreased mental status, especially if they're unconscious, we do it IV. We give dextrose 50 IV. It requires a large IV because it's thick, okay? But you can give, if the patient is completely unconscious and you give them dextrose D50, uh, and, and IV is the only way to give it, then uh, they will, usually they will become responsive within just a couple minutes. It doesn't take very long at all for them to uh, start regaining their person, place, time, and event. And then we want to determine the underlying cause so it doesn't happen again, right? <clears throat> So those are, the, those are the cases that you sort of look at with hypoglycemic patients. Okay? It's, it's much easier to, to take care of. Hyperglycemic patients, again, we always con uh, control the airway. We always do a D-stick. <clears throat> Depending upon your scope of practice, this patient needs to have fluids. Okay. Uh, because of the one because of the I didn't mention it but the three P's of diabetes anybody remember those polyuria polyuria right Poly I don't know when it was the like hunger thirst and then hunger right yeah so polyuria so this one one way the body gets rid of some of this and it's not a good way at all is uh, this excess blood, uh, blood glucose is through the urine so you have a patient that's urinating a lot okay which leads to the dehydration okay which leads to the need of fluid then polyphagia which is excessive hunger then polydipsia which is the excessive thirst they're thirsty their thirst centers in their brain are going crazy because they're urinating so much, they're becoming dehydrated. So dehydration is one of the factors in hyperglycemic patients. Uh, so we give them fluids. The other thing that we would do is give the patient insulin, again, depending on your scope of practice. Obviously the fluids and the insulin is outside of the EMT scope of practice, but they would need insulin. They would need to adjust that blood sugar, okay? Uh, with the with the insulin the labs that we look in so we get this patient maybe they're in a clinical setting a hospital setting so that the labs that they sort of look at that we'll talk about in just a second uh, to rule out possible DKA diabetic ketoacidosis uh, they want to look at the pH of the blood for acidity and then with the CO2, they want to get an ABG or an arterial blood gas. And they really want to un determine the underlying cause. Why is this patient hyperglycemic? Because this can, the hyperglycemic can lead into diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, we talk about hyperglycemia being sort of a long term. Okay, it takes several days. So does DKA. It takes several days, and usually the factor, the underlying factor behind diabetic ketoacidosis is sepsis. The patient is sick. It, so, the, uh, so now, with a DKA patient, we have to not only fix the hyperglycemic, but we also have to work on the illness that was the underlying cause. EMT-wise, Hyperglycemia, you would control the airway and transport. That's, that's uh, your, your sort of limit. But these other things are going to take place at the advanced life support or ALS uh, in, the, in the clinical setting or the, uh, the hospital setting. Everybody good? Questions? Okay, so let's look at before we switch topics, let's look at DKA right quick.
diabetic ketoacidosis. Now this is, this patient here, uh, they're, they're septic or they have sepsis, they're sick, they, that's the, usually the underlying cause of it. And there's multiple problems with, with that patient just besides the, the illness is one, their CO2, they're, they're hyperglycemic, and, and so what's taking place is their CO2 is going to be elevated, again, sort of back to that uh, citric acid cycle in review. So their, their CO2 is going to be, maybe it'll be 50, 60, right? So we need to get this down, the CO2 down, okay? And we can, the body will do that, like we discussed just a second ago, the body will do that through hyperventilation. It's uh, with DKA, you get this KUSS, K-U-S-S, small respirations. And small respirations are deep, fast respirations. They're, they're trying to eliminate that, that CO2. Okay? If the patient is unresponsive and intubated, then we can do that with the ventilator or the bag valve mask as long as we are monitoring this uh, entitled CO2. But what we get with this elevated CO2 is a respiratory acidosis. And, uh, and the acidosis, the metabolic acidosis, which is the bud pH, okay, but uh, we get an excess lact lactate from the pyruvate, pyruvate, py okay, word day, pyruvate, okay, and that will lead into the, the DKA. We're going to control this, the CO2 with ventilation, okay, and then we're going to control the blood pH, which is the metabolic acidosis, okay, uh, with sodium bicarbonate. So what we would do here in the hospital setting, the ALS side, to, to combat that, maybe they're like at a 6-9 or, or so. Uh, they're, they're acidic, they have a, their blood pH is acidic, and so they're in a metabolic acidosis. We would, on the ALS side, we administer sodium bicarbonate to adjust that blood pH. The body is going to do this somewhat, okay, uh, initially with what's called base excess. And the body will release bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, uh, to adjust the pH, like a big Tums, okay, in the bloodstream. It's going to try to absorb some of that uh, ex excessive uh, acidity in the blood. So we breathe faster for the excessive amount of CO2. We have base excess released from the body for the, for the initial acidity of the blood. And this is all the body's attempt to return to homeostasis. So what they would do in the hospital setting, they will uh, draw blood to look at the urea and the creatine, and both of these are uh, kidney functions. Because what, what's taking place when we're burning those fatty acids is this over here, this beta oxidation. It's a catabolic process, meaning that it's uh, like a catabolic process with the muscles that you don't want to take place, it's where it's eating or breaking down those muscles. You almost get a thing for cannibalism there, right? So it's eating itself, it's, it's breaking itself down, and this is where we get this uh, fatty acid. It's a metabolic way to break down molecules into small units, but you know, when we're talking about muscle tissue or fatty acids, we don't we don't really want that. And of course they will draw a potassium level. They get a potassium level because of the polyuria, the excessive urination. They're, they're losing, uh, with the shift, they're losing a lot of potassium. Oh, uh, and then of course the ABG to look at the uh, PCO2 
and the acidity, blood acidity. I'm trying to think if missed anything as far as DKA concerned. So insulin to repair. I mean these guys they might have like a six seven hundred glucose level, right? So insulin to to offset that might be an insulin drip, right? In an ICU uh, department, they might have an insulin drip. Okay, uh, a bicarbonate drip for the acidosis. If the uh, if the patient's not unconscious, they're really looking towards that. So uh, the patient may be intubated and they're going to fix that uh, CO2 problem through hyperventilation. Even with the vent, they're going to hyperventilate the patient and then fix the underlying problem with the DKA, which like I said, it's usually the, the sepsis. Everybody, okay, everybody good? Any questions on diabetic emergencies? All right. Oh, last one. Then diabetic neuropathy is, uh, we see this, we, we learned this on, from the commercials. What happens is, with this buildup over a period of years, those little tiny capillary, those vessels, those capillary vessels that lead to the nerves, they get sort of, in a simple way, they get clogged up with uh, blood, blood glucose, they get clogged up with that sugar, and blood can't get to the nerve, and it brings down, uh, so with, it's, it's sort of, it's like an obstruction, okay? So they can't get oxygen nutrients to the nerves, and they feel that nerve damage. You see a lot of blood, uh, diabetic patients that it hurts to walk because they have that. This also explains uh, how, it, like a non-compliant diabetic, they end up losing their toes and their extremities, blindness, the same way in those those tiny uh, those tiny blood vessels. Okay, now we're to a different subject. And we'll stop here. We'll do that another day. Any questions before we stop?